Laurel and Hardy, Beavis and Butthead, Fanny and Johnny, all famed double acts, but I think the AHC may be about to witness the birth of another great duo, as CBRE Hotels Productions brings you the latest episode of a market overview, the good, the bad, and the lumpy. Please welcome to the stage David Ant Bailey, Senior Director, and Joe Deck Stather, Associate Director of CBRE Hotels. Goodness me, there's a, yeah, there's, a, there's a motivational prankster. It wasn't a P45, but someone gave me some very encouraging words. So thank you, whoever that was. I feel the love. Great. Well, good afternoon, AHC. It's great to be back. And thank you all for being here for CBRE Hotels Market Roundup and Overview. Um, now, you've, you've had plane charts in the past. You've had moving charts to music and video. And last year, I subjected you to a vox pops of my expert CBRE colleagues, including our semi-naked chief economist, thankfully with censored nipples. Yes, you did have to be there, but it was just like that. Well, ever in pursuit of new ways to convey what's happening, to alleviate the unpleasant side effects of PowerPoint overload, and to liven up what can otherwise be somewhat dry and data-laden fare, I've enlisted the help of one of my favorite millennials, my colleague and political sparring partner, and a lad that loves his lycra, Mr. Joe Stather. Now, a round of applause, I think, for Joe for that bike ride again. He's, he's, a, he's a great creative mind and an irrepressible optimist, and we've had some fun putting our presentation together for you, and I hope you'll enjoy what will be an informative session. We're fortunate to have a great team back at base to uh, support the you know, compilation of this, and I'm particularly grateful for the Hotstats data feeds that we have access to and the AMPM supply database that underpins what we're going to share with you. We'll be covering performance and supply. We'll try and pepper that with pertinent market insight to give you a sense as to how the hotel sector is performing and the factors that are shaping and will shape performance going forward. So, the good, the bad, and the lumpy. Really? I'm not sure I came up that one. I'll leave you to decide. You're the lumpy. Who's I think I probably am the lumpy one, I have to admit it. But let's hope security has done a good job keeping out any pranksters, well, not with uh, what I just showed you, proffing their P45s. The larynx is attuned and ready to go. I can't see Philip Hammond in the audience, so there'll be no need to suck on one of his ineffectual lozenges or anything Jonathan might uh, offer me. And I'm assured that the AHC technicians have used the best of he adhesive available in constructing this great stage. So, with no further ado, Joe. Thank you. Great. So this year we've styled our presentation on the front page of a newspaper. Uh, we'll be bringing you what we believe to be the key stories related to UK hotel operating performance and, of course, investment. I can assure you that the CBRE Chronicle, despite David and I's political differences, is politically neutral and would have no concern should a second phase of the Leveson go ahead. So to the headlines, well the big news item is that regional UK performance goes platinum with provincial full service hotel occupancy climbing to record levels up to a heady 76%. It's up 1.8 percentage points year on year to August this year and this stellar performance has enabled hoteliers to increase average rates by just shy of 3% and thus increase revpar by 5.4%. Joe, tell us what's been happening further down the provincial hotel P&L. So total revenue growth continues to lag slightly behind that of rooms, growing at 3.8% year-to-date, and that's year-on-year. Year. We have seen some slight inflation in undistributed operating expenses at 1.4%, but notably payroll is up 2.8%. Nonetheless, all of that strong rate growth that Mr. B just mentioned is handsomely driving the bottom line, with gross operating profit per available room up 4.2% year-on-year. Now, you might wonder why we have a picture of a young Tony Blackburn. Well, regular listeners of the wireless will know that it's 50 years of BBC Radio 1 and Radio 2. So we decided to cover the main 12 regional markets as something of a chart rundown. Joe, did I really hear you say wireless then? It's retro, Dave. Oh. Okay, there's hope for me yet. While sticking with our radio DJ theme, that's Dave and Joe, we're going to run through the top 12 market movers year on year to August, RevPAR movement that is. It's a change from the animated worm that some of you are used to and which is taking a well-earned conference break this year. 
Now, we've 126 seconds, approximately, of backing music to run through our top 12 provincial markets rundown, so buckle up. More supply than oil in the pipeline, anchored to the bottom is Aberdeen, a non-mover at 12. Brighton at 11, down 10 from 1. After a vertiginous fall, it's no longer rocking after a sizzling 2016. Modest revenue growth, but profit down 4%. Leeds slips three places to 10. At Newcastle, up 9. <laughs> Sorry, up 2 from 11 at 9. Off the back of firming of occupancy, but let down by a slide in rate. At 8, Birmingham starting to benefit as businesses look beyond London. Glasgow at 7, up 3 from 10, it gains ground on the back of rising occupancy and rate getting closer to that Commonwealth Games year zenith. Rate growth of 4.7% and profit growth of 8, Bristol powers up 3 places to 6. And at 5, it's our venue city Manchester, down 1 from 4. It drops 1 place, though keeps that star quality at 83% occupancy. Conferences, events and the leisure segment drives Liverpool up 1 place at 4. At three, it's Cardiff. Up three from six, with occupancy popping and rate rocking. Up 7%, the Welsh capital whips up to third. I'm not even going to try the accent for Belfast. Uh, testament to the efforts of Tourism Northern Ireland and up six places at two, we have Belfast. Tremendous growth in leisure and conference business, which is really driving midweek and off-peak performance. And at number one, it's Edinburgh, the most sought-after market after London. It takes top spot, moving up two from three, with an occupancy of 85%, rate up 14%, driving Revpar to an eye-popping, chart-topping 17%. Now, we should remember that all of the data that we're referring to excludes branded budget hotels, and it relates to full-service hotels only, and that the impressive market performance is despite a burgeoning and rapacious disruptor e eating increasing amounts of hoteliers' lunch in the form of Airbnb and other shared economy platforms. So, Joe, let's share some of our views of the factors shaping market performance. So it's about time we mentioned the B word. Uh, is Brexit driving the British staycation? There is data out there suggesting that an almost 25% rise in the number of UK travellers which have opted for a domestic holiday this year. However, we might not have seen the full impact yet. If you, like me, don't seem to have noticed a stark increase in the price of flights and holidays abroad, that's largely due to the effect of hedging. So many of the large tour operators and airlines bought currency and agreed contracts in advance of last June's Brexit vote. And this has so far insulated both them and us as the consumer. However, with the low pound looking weak for the foreseeable, hedged currency resources starting to run low, and existing contracts reaching expiry, many industry analysts are expecting a stark rise in the cost of holidays through 2018. And this really could drive the demand for staycations even more the year ahead. Although this will come at a cost. I mentioned earlier a 2.8% increase in payroll year to date for the UK provinces. Some cities are seeing a much greater impact. So take Birmingham, Cardiff and Manchester as examples, and all of these have seen payroll inflation at over 5% year to date. As an industry, we are highly exposed to an overseas workforce, and falling immigration, increasing emigration, and a very low UK unemployment rate is seemingly starting to bite in the hotel space. And factors outside of Brexit are also having an impact on the, on the, on the decisions concerning travel. David. Well, when you consider the relentlessly depressing news from failed airlines, hurricanes, bombs, bullets, and senseless, hideous, random attacks, however remote the probability of such events affecting you, they can weigh heavily on the psyche when it comes to booking that holiday abroad. On the other hand, our unique and unreliable British weather means that guaranteed sunshine remains a powerful draw, particularly when combined with a keenly priced offer. Though, as Joe just touched on, prices could be firming next year. But folk aren't staying home under duress. We've seen a renaissance of some of our seaside resorts. I think Margate is a fine case in point. And only last week I saw that Malmaison has announced a scheme in Bournemouth on the site of a former hotel, providing welcome churn and following Hilton and Hampton by Hilton's entry into that market. And there is some great product out there. But it's worth noting that the staycation trend isn't just benefiting our coastal resorts. 
We have a health and well-being trend which is sweeping the nation, and a third of our population are planning a rural break. Country house hotels are therefore faring well, with some pretty decent top-line growth. And on to the weather, with David Schaffernacker. <laughs> I won't imitate his famous YouTube clip. Um, right, well, the weather. Are we set for a supply storm, I guess, is the question. In the provinces, it's been relatively benign, and we have some healthy closures, if they can be considered healthy in that context, and that's helping in the rejuvenation of the sector, the Malmaison example I just gave you. But what do these numbers mean in terms of the number of rooms and the additional room nights that hoteliers and their managers and brand systems will need to find? There are some 16,300 provincial hotel rooms due to open in what's left of this year and throughout 2018. Now, those are confirmed opening date projects. And if you look at those on an annualized basis, then if we're to maintain that 76% occupancy we referred to in the earlier headlines, then operators and brands are going to have to find another 4.5 million room nights or 12,400 room nights per day. Easy, right? I guess that comment was made earlier with a record number of overseas visitors. We're having an extra 2.25 million of them this year. As long as the majority of them stay in hotels, they're going to go some way to uh, swallowing up that supply. So that was the pipeline at a macro level, but of course, countrywide averages can be somewhat misleading. The devil is quite often in the detail. So we're going to pick out a few markets in the interest of time, but if there's any of the others you wish to discuss, do come and see us on our stand downstairs. Mr. B? Okay, it's Birmingham, my uh, home city. Sorry. Yeah, well, I'll, <laughs> I'll find that one. Um, there's been big improvements in Birmingham City's infrastructure underway. We've got the HS2 project, and if any of you have seen what's happened to New Street Station and uh, its reemergence of, of Grand Central, it really is dramatic, highlighting the city as an attractive place to invest. We're fortunate at CBRE to have Anne Walsh in our team. Uh, she's a director based in our Birmingham office, and, and she's here at the AHC today. Do say hello to her if you see her, and I can share some of her observations as quickly. She tells me that uh, only last month, Number 3 Arena Central secured the largest pre-let in a decade for the UK government uh, to accommodate 3,600 employees. This is on the back of HSBC's early commitment to site its new UK headquarters there, accommodating 2,500. Birmingham's got a new mayor. It's also front runner for the Commonwealth Games venue in 2022. And yet, there's only four confirmed schemes with 442 rooms in the supply pipeline at the moment. However, with all this good news, we can expect it to unlock some of the 12 schemes with 1,300 rooms that are currently listed in projects that are on hold. Manchester, a 9% increase on existing supply is expected for Manchester. 38 rooms left to open this year, 916 rooms to open in 2018, and currently 674 confirmed for 2019. 67% of this confirmed pipeline is represented by four-star hotels, and 28% will fall under service departments. This is reflective of Manchester's impressive hotel performance levels, a bright future owing to infrastructure development, and a thriving local economy that is growing faster than both the London and the UK average. Now, Edinburgh remains the most sought-after hotel market in the UK outside of London. That chart-topping RevPAR growth is attracting developers like moths to the flame, there are 17 confirmed projects with 2,103 rooms, to be precise, and that's five times the confirmed pipeline for Brum that I just mentioned. Courtyard by Marriott's coming back for seconds this year in Edinburgh West with 160 rooms. Hampton by Hilton will be making its market debut with 228 rooms, also in Edinburgh West, and taking reservations for arrival next week, I believe. It'll be followed next year with 175 rooms at the airport. The Hampton will be joined by a 213-room Moxie there in 2019. Edinburgh Airport really is flying at the moment, literally, reporting that more than 1.4 million travellers pass through its gates during August, making it the busiest August on record. And we'll see a 150-room hub by Premier Inn hit the hay market in 2018. You've probably all spotted a trend. It's gone branded budget select service-tastic in that market, and almost half of all confirmed rooms there are in that space. And then finally, touching on Belfast. So 33% sounds and looks like a lot of new stock to enter that market. However, we spoke about the impressive levels of hotel performance in Belfast at present. With a current year-to-date occupancy level of 85.6%, we can be optimistic about the city's ability to absorb some new rooms. Most of the pain will come in 2018, with 1,154 of the 1,300 rooms due to open. 
although this will leave the city with the high-quality hotel stock to market alongside its world-class tourism offering. Well, we're over halfway through, and we've managed to avoid talking about London, but we can't ignore this simply awesome market any longer. 4,800 new rooms have been added so far this year. That's up 3.2%. Occupants has increased 1.6 percentage points to 81% and turbocharged in a Brexit bonanza, average rate has surged 7.8% and RevPAR up by 9.3%. That's driving total revenues up 7.4%, double that of the provincial rate, and that's increasing GOTPAR, gross operating profit per available room, by over 10%. It's impressive stuff by any measure. Impressive stuff indeed, but I think we must remember that pre-EU referendum, London RevPAR growth had stalled. Relentless new supply weighed heavy on operating performance. London still has a hefty pipeline, and the impact of the weak pound is increasingly factored in, and therefore that supply risk may well start to bubble back up. So a whistle-stop tour of the capital's pipeline broken down by Borough, and are developers still searching for the next Shoreditch? Well, those storm clouds are appreciably darker, those supply storm clouds, that is, over London, and London's already banked that currency Brexit boost. So where is that supply headed? Well, what we're showing here are those London boroughs with the lowest rate of supply growth, and they're showing there from 12 up to 7. It's worth pointing out that some caution needs to be exercised with Westminster when this borough houses the greatest individual borough room total of 38,438 rooms, which is 25% of Greater London's total supply. So that 7% uplift there translates to an anticipated 2,700 rooms. That's the greatest of all London boroughs and more than Edinburgh's. And then through to the top six boroughs in terms of pipeline as a percentage of existing supply. With a confirmed pipeline representing 14%, we have Newham, which of course includes Stratford and the Olympic Park, City Airport and the XL Exhibition Centre. Tower Hamlets, which covers much of London's traditional East End, uh, a borough of contrast, I think it's fair to say, with the tremendous wealth of Canary Wharf, but of course some of the highest levels of poverty in the UK. It has a pipeline of 25%, which include the Curio Lincoln Plaza at the Isle of Dogs, and a dual-branded aloft element planned for tobacco docks. And finally, with a pipeline representing 27% of existing supply, is the City of London. We have a range of new hotels confirmed, including a 326-room Premier Inn at Farringdon, which is perfectly located for the new Crossrail Hub, a 342-room Canopy by Hilton at Oldgate, and a new 246-room Citizen M St. Paul's, which is due in 2019. So moving on to the subject of hotel investment, and we've seen a number of big deals close this year, not limited to the sale of the Metropoles, which has buoyed the year-to-date 2017 UK deal volume up 47% year-on-year and nicely ahead of the long-run average. The split between the regions and London in terms of capital deployed is 55% to 45%, and single-asset sales have accounted for 52% of total UK hotel investment. But with some significant opportunities currently in the market, who are likely to be the buyers, Dave? Well, understanding sources of capital is key to our business, and much talk has been on Asia, which has recently been dominated by aggressive Chinese investors and other regional players that were being outcompeted by them. In London, we're fortunate to have Jeline Liu, Director of International Capital Markets, who's focused exclusively on Asian capital. We like to call her Mystic Lou with that omniscient crystal ball of hers. And what Jeline is seeing is that after significant slowing in outbound Chinese investment off the back of greater capital controls, we can expect to see an increasingly diverse spectrum of Asian capital investors from countries like Singapore, Japan, Korea, and Malaysia, countries that are sufficiently capitalized and confident to pursue outbound investments and are also providing an alternative outlet for Chinese capital. But it's not all about Asia, though. There is still US and Eurozone capital appetite for the right deals, such as single-asset bolt-ons and turnaround stores, etc. But we can certainly expect more from the East. It's probably time, Joe, that we had a look at the sports news. And what does our sports pundit say? Or should I say our peaky blinder, looky-likey, checkmate chess? So our head of UK hotel valuations, Bobby Chess, double S, no T, has seen a stable year in terms of hotel yields for operational assets. Vacant possession yields in the capital for an upscale hotel sit somewhere around 4.5%, and for a prime regional location, around 6.25%. 
Investors are still favoring flexibility as yields for management contracts were around 100 basis points higher in London and 125 basis points higher in prime regional locations. It's worth noting that in the leased space, we have seen yield sharpening across pretty much all locations, such as the increasing appetite for long-dated fixed income hotel investments. Given the lack of yield contraction and operational investments, we are seeing increasingly creative deal structuring and emphasis on optimizing the cash flow in order to drive returns and capital values. And so we move to the puzzles and brain teasers. So to firstly summarize the current state of the nation, I think it's fair to say that the UK is in high demand. Good growth across all performance metrics and a total UK average occupancy of 78% year to date. This performance has been achieved against a backdrop of fairly limited supply growth, which we know is starting to become a more significant piece of the equation as we look forward. Nonetheless, robust demand is also carrying into the investment market, strong pricing and a diverse depth of bidders. So what are the key headwinds and opportunities for the months ahead, Mr. Bailey? Well, I think populism is high up there amongst them. Trump, Corbyn, Catalonia, and so it goes on. And everyone just seems to be so angry, so resentful. It really is the age of rage, as someone described it to me. Just look at the unfolding situation in Catalonia, and quite where that will end, I just don't know. But populism is all around Europe. It's a sign of the times. I think we all have to be braced for the unexpected in our businesses, and it's here to stay. Security is a key factor. I don't need to go into detail of the horrendous attacks witnessed over recent months, and least of all in this great city. But suffice it to say that tourists and the places they frequent are easy targets, and we must maintain our guard. Interest rates. We've had a clear expose from Trevor just now, so I won't repeat that. And it's quite encouraging in terms of the direction of travel that he's expecting. Um, but clearly, inflation is a risk in the mix. And we have seen um, you know, rising costs coming through the business. I'll just jump to inflation there. But on interest rates, clearly, if they drive up, we'll see an increased cost of capital, increase in yields, just squeezing on disposable incomes. And uh, we'll probably see some kind of strengthening of the pound, maybe. But as Trevor suggested, the movement is likely to be slight at sort of a quarter of a percent. On inflation, Trevor's covered this. He's saying it could fall back next year. That's going to be welcome news, I guess, to Nick Northam, who on an earlier panel was highlighting some of the inflation he was seeing coming through his business. I think where we are seeing evidence of inflation certainly is in the labor piece. And I think you know, we, we heard that employment is at the highest for 42 years. The international labor market will tighten, both in hotel operations and construction work, and we've heard a lot of that already. As a sector, we've had easy access to and become hooked on cheap labor. So I think improving our allure to those entering the employment market, and, or, and that's at a school level, or those already in it, or those that are retired and perhaps looking to re-enter it, I believe will be the defining sector challenge of the next decade. As wage pressure builds, so we see the need for greater flexibility around fixed labor and outsourcing, as well as all means possible to enhance productivity and guest experiences at whatever level of the market you are operating. Innovation. Innovation, I think Trevor touched on innovation earlier. It's a, it's a key theme, I think certainly for me. I think there's a lot of great innovation out there, and I draw great reassurance from this. And necessity is the mother of invention. We're seeing new concepts. We're seeing new ownership and financial structures. And as, as the various elements of our marketplace respond creatively to the opportunities that are presented. I must say that I'm particularly pleased to see food and beverage, or F&B, back to the fore, taking center stage in many schemes. I say F&B, I should get on trend like those hip folk at Kimpton and call it R&B. But whatever, it can transform hotel operating performance overall and can be key to destination creation and placemaking. I think going forward, it will be a case of do it well or don't do it at all. And finally, management. It really is very difficult to predict anything in the current environment with a high degree of certainty, and especially at a market average level. Now, it's clear from what we've gone through and heard earlier today that not all markets and not all businesses are being affected equally, and confidence is inevitably fragile. So faced with that uncertainty, how do you ensure your hotel investment performs to its full potential in its market and location context? Well, it's about the GM, isn't it? The management company, the brand. Well, as we look into 2018 and beyond, this is when we'll be able to see who the winners are. The road ahead presents some really challenging obstacles to negotiate, as I've just touched on, 
and perhaps the greatest challenges facing hoteliers in the near to midterm is the labour issue and increasing supply volume. It's at times like these that the metal and ability of management and brand delivery and systems will be tested and we find out those who really do earn their spurs and their fees. So ladies and gents, thank you very much for listening. Um, AHC, thank you for having us. Please do come and see us on our stand. We would really love to get your feedback and further this discussion. You can also pick up a copy of our front page and perhaps an invite to our drinks event this evening, along with some of the other CBRE hotels research. So it's good afternoon from me. And it's good afternoon from him.